Wonderful. Hi, everybody. Good day. I'm Kyle Ellicott, your host for another edition of VC TV. Yesterday, we had a, an exciting episode talking about how things were shifting and changing around work, remote, and education technologies. And one of the common threads uh, that we continued to have from all of our speakers and investors uh, was the power of artificial intelligence and data and how these underlining components have been powering uh, various industries and new waves of companies along with uh, new products as well. And so we put together this outstanding panel of investors from around the world uh, to join us to further that conversation and talk about what's happening in artificial intelligence, what's happening in machine learning, and what's happening in de data, whether that's at the investment level or the development level, as things have shifted and moved very dramatically, and in some cases, probably further accelerated these areas and technologies faster than anyone would have expected uh, almost six months ago. Uh, and so with that, a quick shout out to Elena and to the entire LA Token team for making this happen. And thank you to our live audience uh, for tuning in. At any point, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, you just want to say hi, feel free to drop a message in the chat and we'll try to make uh, uh, those questions come alive during our conversation. If not, all of us are available, including each of our speakers online and all social media, as they will mention towards the end of the show uh, as well. But without further ado, as your host, it is my honor to start introducing each and every one of our speakers. Um, guys, uh, would love to introduce, welcome each of you, just a quick uh, introduction and background on how you got started uh, in your industry. And we'll go Brady Bunch style. So Ravi, let's, let's start with you. Just uh, un unmute myself. Can you guys hear me? Loud and clear. Okay, perfect. Uh, yeah, thank you, Kyle. So I'll give you a, a quick introduction on myself. I spent the majority of my career in the financial slash securities industry in one capacity or another. The bulk of the time with uh, either Deutsche Bank or Barclays Capital, where I spent the time in various capacities across quantitative research, securities trading and equities and credit and uh, sort of cross asset macro trading desks. Uh, and off in around 2015, where I felt like there was a little bit of a, a sort of a, a change in direction required, I decided to sort of start looking at what, how different types of technologies were you, being used in the sort of quote unquote fintech industry. And I realized that there was a, there was a gap for, for certain types of technologies that went beyond traditional systematic trading in terms of rule, rules-based statistical arbitrage and that sort of thing. And at that sort of time, I got connected with some guys who were sort of not in the financial industry at all, but were um, sort of experts in various other scientific fields, but they had in common that they'd used uh, AI and more specifically deep and reinforcement learning to enable the research they were doing. So uh, I became part of sort of uh, this group that has further evolved into the company that we run now, which is called Magic, Magic Carpet AI, which in a nutshell, so I don't drone on for too long, is effectively a systematic asset manager, digital asset manager driven by large amounts of data. But um, I would emphasize that it's sort of very, very tech driven. So our dream would be to sort of become a Google slash BlackRock type institution obviously that's a big big pipe dream at this stage but um that's that, that's the direction we're headed it's good to have big pipe or pipe dreams <laughs> and good to have big goals so <laughs> don't be ashamed of that we're, we're happy on that and if anything it should be inspiring to you our audience uh as well and uh ivan welcome to the show uh we were laughing a few minutes ago but uh, i'm now happy to hear your voice and same to you quick introduction and how you got into the space I used to be a uh, CEO of different uh, software companies for many, many years. And then at some point, uh, I decided that they, uh, most people didn't understand at the time the life cycle capital needs of the companies and the fact that enterprise software is going to become more and more dominant in the venture capital uh, world. So uh, I, will, I actually ran Wells Fargo's tech investment banking for a while, and then I got into investing. And uh, what we want to look for is enterprise software companies 
that use AI to solve really, really big problems for large enterprises. For example, we have a company right now that is using AI to optimize manufacturing, and they use a variety of software and sensors to do that. We are uh, investing in a company called Fama that is uh, AI for uh, people that make large numbers of hires to examine them um, uh, based on their online presence as to their propensity for bad language or bad behavior or things like that. And the list goes on and on. Uh, we are investing in a company that is using enterprise software and AI to manage containers around the world. So uh, I think this is a big and growing field. I think people that figure out how to do it well are going to do really well in it. And we are in search of finding those people. Our, our fund is called Navigate Ventures. I love it. And you're actually jumping ahead because I was going to come back and ask what were some of the use cases. So you've already pointed out, which is great. i um, looking forward to hearing more on that. Dan, welcome to the show. I'm not sure if you're in the mountains or uh, if you're enjoying uh, the countryside in the Midwest, but nonetheless, welcome to the show and a quick introduction and a little background. Yeah, how you doing? Thanks. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Uh, now I'm, uh, that's aspirational, being there in the mountains. So um, yeah, I'm based in Chicago. I'm a, a managing director at 4490 Ventures. Hopefully you can see that on my over here there, my logo. Um, uh, I, uh, I've been about half my career as a venture capital investor, half as a startup founder. I've started three software companies. I was a, um, a code writing um technical founder in two of them. So I was a C, C++ programmer uh, earlier in my career. And then um, after the second one, I, I uh, went into the venture capital business uh, and did that for about a decade and then came back and started another company in digital health uh, and, then, um, and then moved back into uh, venture here. 4490 Ventures, we're a series A stage firm. We got about hundred million under management um, and we, uh, we focus on what we call connected software, which is uh, in encompasses AI and machine learning. Uh, it it's really, we're saying that, that software alone is not enough to create venture class returns, it, that the software is the delivery vehicle for value, but the value is often, it is, is a uh, value differentiator comes from it being connected to something else. Uh, proprietary hardware that maybe uh, generates uh, proprietary data or proprietary data sources, proprietary algorithms, things like that. And then, and then it gets pushed out typically into the enterprise via, via software. Uh, we, we will look at some consumer um, uh, companies, but, but we're principally enterprise focused investors. I love it. As a uh, Midwesterner born and way, raised about four hours uh, east of you, I am, I'm proud to have you on the show as well. So uh, it's the first time for me. Take a little moment to shout out that. Uh, right. uh, welcome. Uh, Gwen. Hi, welcome to the show. Uh, same to you. A, a quick introduction, a little background on how you got into the space. Sure. Um, so I joined uh, Fusion Fund as a venture partner last year. So I've been around for a year with Fusion. And prior to that, I was an angel investor since 2012. Um, and uh, during that time, I actually spent, uh, prior to uh, 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 Venture, I actually spent 18 years on Wall Street. Um, uh, analyst years were at Goldman, associate years were at JP Morgan, and then I was a buy-side analyst for five different shops, uh, culminating as a portfolio manager at Tech Hedge Fund. So I've done, uh, I've run the gamut of uh, credit to public equities to now private equities, uh, very early stage. So Fusion Fund is um, a seed plus A, mostly A, um, we, uh, I was just looking at our portfolio. Uh, we have over 40 companies now and more than half are definitely AI. Um, and the, I would say I would group them into four different applications. Um, there's definitely vision, language, health, and then data analytics. And for each one of the categories, we have at least um, three different companies in, uh, in each. Super excited about what's happening. Um, actually, as a result of the interest, I ended up uh, so I do have a minor in computer science, electrical engineering, so it didn't come from nowhere. And my major was the math track of econ, but I ended up getting um, super into Python and getting the full uh, five course certification in deep learning neural networks. And now I'm pursuing the one for uh, AI applied uh, to medicine. So 
Um, now I can definitely call BS <laughs> on the AI washing. Um, but you know, I, I think the benefit is I'm now the pinch hitter free co- free programmer for any of our portfolio companies if they're running short on uh, on coders. When insane! I hope you mic drop throughout this entire conversation. Just all of the knowledge you you just started with. I mean. Get ready. You're going. You're our technical lead. So, guys, you've heard it first. She's the validator. You say anything wrong, Gwen, you've got the rights to call everybody out. So, I've got a programmer. Programmer. So, I'll, I'll be calling you. And there you go. You just got a. You just got a gig. So now, now we've we've made the magic happen. And as we round out, last but not least, a good friend and a regular guest who I enjoy working with every single day on VC TV, Tess Howe of Howe Ventures. Welcome to the show. Even though you don't need an intro, I'm going to give it to you anyways. Uh, A little history and an intro on how you got here. Thank you. Thank you, Kyle. It's always great to to be on the panel. And a shout out to Gwen. Um, I think it was only, what, 10 days ago we were on another panel. And uh, it's always amazing. And several years ago in person at our uh, Latokan conferences in SF, um, she definitely is an amazing moderator and, uh, you know, uh, definitely speaker. So I'm really happy today. And... uh, the rest of the panel also I'm looking forward to having great discussions. Myself, um, Tess Howell, founder of Tess Ventures. Um, I wasn't always investing, started off with being an operator, a founder, uh, right from undergrad. Um, and then later started um, several companies, super fortunate after some hard work in parallel with the degree. Uh, by the time we graduated, uh, my co-founder and I had um, you know, uh, several acquisitions for one of the company. And with that said, I felt it was a good time to um, actually sell the company, later moved on to paying it forward, investing it back into other uh, founders. So we focus on early stage investing. Um, The journey there is most critical and most rewarding. Um, You know, the highs are so high, the lows are lows. So I think being an investor that really is able to help the founding team with you know, being in the trenches, side by side, a proactive investor, that's our goal. Uh, we also have teams that are, um, I would like to call like SWAT team, where we can actually help um, bring in the right talents and actually you know, be intern, you know, CFO, COO, or you know, whatever that complimentary is. And if it means actually bringing in CTOs um, or like the business CEO, I've done that with several Stanford teams, um, you know, spent you know, two years, 2011, 2013, getting mentorship at Stanford by some of the most amazing uh, VC friends, professors, and also a lot of the uh, amazing students there. That today, obviously, um, we can all call on if we need mentorship or advice or you know other great speakers. So I'm super happy that I've been investing um, in uh, various sectors. Um, definitely I am sector and the team is sector agnostic. It's about you know the founding team at pre-seed, seed, and also you know post-seed. Um, But also, of course, you know, uh, making sure there's product market fit. So obviously, AI is super important. Um, I started off with more fintech and then also into, um, you know, um, emerging tech, frontier tech. However, um, AI has become critical across the board in every sector and in, you know, so much of the uh, technology that we look at. Um, having several exits in these early stage companies has definitely, you know, given me confirmation that, you know, it's not a spray and pray model. It truly is about, you know, the team composition, their domain expertise. So, um, you know, recent to one of my other entities, there was a VR company, um, construction tech, and also um, biotech. So that's why AI today, um, one of the health tech companies that I am, you know, advisor investor involved, uh, absolutely applies AI to help them um, be able to optimize their information. Um, recently, they did also uh, did a small, um, not pivot, but addition into addition uh, tech um, application right into COVID nineteen space and it's helping several, uh, you know, government uh, countries. Um, they also, you know, really do believe that um, AI should be utilized into any health wellness area, which is critical. And there'll be other stuff that I'm, you know, super going to be able to share more about. Uh, but I think I'll, you know, hand it back to Kyle first. Awesome. Well, welcome everybody, and again, thank you, Tess. It's a pleasure to to, to have you back. Um, you know, guys, I want to kind of start with a big open-ended question. I think it's going to frame a lot of our context today. I believe it was between 2015 and 2017, AI became the buzzword of everything. If, if you said AI, 
you raised more, more capital than you may or may not have needed, or you just got capital because you used the word AI. Uh, and then in some cases, we saw more venture funds uh, get created that were AI focused. And I put air quotes in because I don't think many had a, a definition or a thesis uh, directed to that because AI was still evolving into its role that uh, we're going to talk about today and playing at all levels of call it the technology stack for products uh, and companies uh, going forward. 2017, 2018, 2019, a lot of things happened. A lot of other buzzwords came into play and kind of changed the game for us. And here in 2020, um, you know, it seems that AI has become more apparent and more important than ever and at a true, uh, true infrastructure level. Uh, we now have data sets that are um, very deep, very wide, um, and also very powerful at what they can and can't do. But to Ivan's point, uh, they also need to solve a problem. Um, but people need to know how to build them, as Gwen said, uh, to be able to do that and how they uh, really play a role in all of these different products and services. So Gwen, uh, with that all being said, and no longer are we in the 2015, 2016, 2017, let's all raise capital um, type era, where are we? when it comes to artificial intelligence and where uh, we start to look at data, what does all this look like? Start off on kind of where we are and, and where we go. Oh, and you're on mute. Sorry. Uh, so I'd say, um, and, and I'm sure this is, you know, this is not a new point, but um, I think a few years ago, you know, this is, this actually reminds me, I am old enough to remember the first tech bubble, but this reminds me of when everything was a E something or, you know, like e-commerce was a huge thing. Right. And so, but now everything is E something, right. It's almost like, you know, if you don't have a web presence, you're not a real company anymore. Right. So it's, everything's reversed. And I actually see the same thing happening with AI. It's just going to take a lot shorter. Right. Instead of taking 20 years, I think this is going to be five years. Um, and I could be totally wrong on the on the time frame, but I just know that it's not going to be twenty. So I think you know that's my overall uh, view. I also think that um, the the pace that AI actually penetrates everything is not going to be even, right? And so uh, one one example I'll give you. So the certification I took for AI, we actually had to code um, a software program that when you feed it an X ray, a chest X ray, it has to be able to detect if it has a lesion, right? And I have to get 98% correct in order to pass that particular portion. That's how good we are at that one particular sliver, right? But, you know, can I, can I detect uh, lesion in a stomach? No, like I just don't have the training data. I think that's the other thing is that you have to have a particular sliver of training data. And for chest x-rays, it was 10,000, right? If you don't have something that feeds into the program, you just don't have enough um, training data to get something running. Um, however, I think the positive is as AI, as more people work on this, we've figured out ways to get around it, right? So I'll give you sort of an anecdotal, very interesting story, which is the way we get around with not having enough chest x-ray is we start training on penguin, pictures of penguin, because it's also black and white and it's also lines that you have to detect, right? And so, you know, it's like stuff like that. I mean, I think computer scientists are extremely creative people. Uh, you know, you wouldn't think that they are, but they are. So that gives me hope that, um, you know, I think AI is going to penetrate every single industry, but very, you know, it'll be, uh, the path is not going to be one that you can, you'll, you'll expect. And, and Dan, and I, I agree and, and have been looking at the space as well for, for quite some time around that first, first bubble and heard again, the word AI tossed around and uh, a few too many times, but uh, you've made a good point. And Dan, you know, you're based here in the base, excuse me, in the Midwest. Um, you're also in Chicago where, you know, Northwestern, one of the leading um, universities for artificial intelligence is. Um, I know the fund is based around Madison uh, Wisconsin. So again, very Midwest centric. How are you seeing this, uh, to Gwen's point, further uh, develop on where we are with AI, but even more localized, how is artificial intelligence playing a role in the Midwest, whether it's at the industry level, the university level, et cetera? Yeah, I, I'd say that, um, <clears throat> yeah, we, we are based in the Midwest, but we, we do invest nationwide. Um, and uh, we, it, it goes back to the availability of data uh, as, as Gwen said, and, and um, your algorithms are only as good as what, uh, as what data you can acquire. And uh, that resides in a lot of the incumbent companies and incumbent industries, uh, whether it's 
you know, healthcare, like, you, you know, there's Northwestern on the AI tech side, but also on the, on the healthcare side. And, and um, lots of large healthcare institutions um, are in the middle part of the country, as well as manufacturing and, and distribution. Um, uh, so we're seeing a, a lot of companies that have the core asset to create being, being a part of the solution. Um, and in getting access to that data is, is critical to the, to the startups to uh, be able to do it. I, 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 I'll say one uh, kind of related point to that is we've got a, a portfolio company that is, is trying to remake uh, a data platform for how you can, that, that enables um, AI applications. And that is, most people will say that 80% of the work in an AI app is preparing the data. And, uh, and, and our position and, and that of our portfolio company is that this is because the uh, data management tools were never designed for this kind of use case. They were designed 40 years ago, basically, uh, relational databases were designed 40 years ago for to automate business processes. And, and that, that's really, you know, that, that's why they made all the architectural decisions they made back at the time. So our portfolio company is building, it, it, we don't call it a database, but it replaces existing databases. It uses blockchain uh, with graph style um, uh, uh, database wrapped around it. Blockchain is the core data store. And, um, it, it's, it dramatically changes the cost of being able to develop AI applications. Uh, most applications about, we estimate about 10% of the total cost is in building the, the app itself. Uh, and the other 90% is all the stuff you gotta do around to manage the data and get it in place in the, you know, from data lakes to warehouses and all the security that surrounds it and, and everything else. And, and we're coming at it from kind of an orthogonal way, which is you should change that infrastructure layer. And then your, your costs to develop and deploy these AI solutions are dramatically lower. So anyway, so we're, we're seeing, um, uh, you know, these entrepreneurs, uh, that, that company is based in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. You know, very far from from uh, traditional tech hubs, um, but uh, uh, you know we're 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 seeing innovation at all layers of it, including the data management layer, which many would argue is the most important layer uh, to creating AI apps. I see Gwen shaking her head, so I think we've we've been validated on that. So uh, I I agree. We'll uh, appreciate that. And uh, you know, Ivan, same question to you. Kind of where are we with this? You had uh, called out a few different industries from, from manufacturing to logistics uh, and others that you are seeing um, uh, companies work on in your portfolio. But in general, where are we as an industry when we talk about artificial intelligence or AI? Uh, I remember, and I'm gonna age myself now, uh, when I finished undergrad at McGill, um, they had McGill University and Brown University had two of the leading artificial intelligence labs back then. And AI back then was nothing more than mapping uh, if and thens together. Uh, so where we are right now isn't that much further from that because uh, to, to Dan's point, because the systems that we are using to solve these big problems are the systems of about 20, 30 years ago. So the infrastructure layer is still lagging. Uh, I think there is plenty of, uh, plenty of room to go uh, the, because the, the number of problems that we're trying to solve are enormous. Uh, the examples are everywhere. For example, uh, a, an enormous amount of food is destroyed during transportation. And you'd be shocked that uh, no AI is used to determine the temperature and the humidity of the containers that are being moved to make sure they're adjusted. I mean, that's a simple example that I know somebody's working on. Or when in a world that everything with COVID has to be touch free, why is it that we cannot go to a McDonald's and they would automatically know who we are and we can make our purchase without. So all those applications of solving very big problems are yet to come. So I think in the very, very beginning stages, part of it has to do with our 
uh, ability to adapt to the way it, it will be done from a consumer standpoint. Uh, where we are on an enterprise is much, much easier because uh, a lot of these industries are still very, very backwards. So it's, uh, it's some, but the only competition we have is the existing way of doing things. But I think there is a very long way to go. There is a lot of this intermediation that can occur. Uh, there's a lot of cost that can be taken out of the system. Uh, so we're in the first or second innings at best, in my opinion. But I think we need the tools to further that path. Yeah, I agree. I think first or second inning is a, is a, is a great reference. Uh, Ravi, what about yourself? What are you seeing? Where are we at currently in this, this world of, uh, of AI and, and data? So I, I guess I would start with saying that I'm probably coming at things um, in a slightly from a slightly different tack from some of the other folks on the call. Uh, I'm kind of directly involved in the investment process rather than, in, particularly with securities trading, rather than investing in portfolios of, of companies themselves. Um, I'd like to make a comment first, I guess, on the, the whole buzzword thing. I mean, that's something that everyone has to come through, right? I mean, we'll remember what happened with with blockchain when Bitcoin was exploding in 2017, you know, it was it was ridiculous. You had, I don't know if anybody remembers the stock price of Kodak at the time when they announced that they were going to use it for something ridiculous, uh, and you know, it, and all that sort of stuff. So, and you know, you have a similar you have a similar thing with AI. Actually, in some ways, don't even like the term AI because if anyone's familiar with the Turing test, we're not officially anywhere near AI anyway. So, um, I tend to usually use the the term machine learning and sort of various offshoots from, from that. Uh, and then what I would also say is, is that, I, you know, as far as I'm aware, the initial research for, particularly for the type of technologies we use, which is neural networks, the initial research for that sort of thing came about in the 60s. And from a theoretical and research perspective, it hasn't really moved on that much further than that than that original research because the scientists gave up purely because there wasn't the computational power to take advantage of those types of frameworks, which is why sort of from 2012 onwards, the use of more sophisticated multi-layered neural networks and dense layers has given rise to Facebook's ability to do almost perfect face recognition or Uber's ability to teach a computer how to drive a car. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, is that it's really not so much about the underlying technology and the theory. My view is now, in order for companies and people to leverage the, the technology and the research, it's really more about the individual domain knowledge of individual companies and, and individuals themselves to actually harness what, what is available in terms of what, what is achievable via neural networks or the computation, computational power that's available now and really be able to use that to further what they're doing in their own field. So, I mean, my example, again, my example for that would be in my, in my field, which is uh, securities trading, we're trying to apply techniques which have been applied in many other domains in a domain whereby actually it's lagging um, in, uh, in many ways. I mean, obviously, sort of statistical arbitrage and using more traditional machine learning techniques which are very deterministic has been around in securities trading for 40 years however we feel like we're doing something which is taking it to the next level by actually using this deep and deep uh, and reinforcement learning algorithms to train uh, trading bots that actually behave in a very different way and will be able to give returns to our investors that are completely uncorrelated to what they've seen from other hedge funds, whether they be uh, whether they be discretionary traders or systematic players themselves. And we, we truly believe that we're only sort of a, a one of a small handful of companies that's really scratching the surface in this space. So, so I guess the, the the moral of my story is it's really it's really until you really get another breakthrough in terms of the underlying research for how we train computers to learn. Uh, it's really about how do we apply what we know now and take other fields uh, to the next level. Yeah, and, and, and with that being said, I mean, you, you bring up the, the term neural networks and, and you kind of start to unpack um, 
you know, how that data is being looked at or how that data is being used. And Gwen, I want to come to you for, for a moment because uh, as you are the experts, um, but, uh, you know, all, all, all teasing aside, um, you do have this very um, expert view uh, of the categories um, on how AI is broken down, right? So you called out language, vision, health, analytics. How does this all play a role? Why these areas? Why um, are you guys looking at it? As Ravi's calling out, you know, uh, looking at uh, AI, not really as the term, but more around machine learning uh, and this idea of the bigger neural network. How are you seeing AI driving uh, a few different themes further and how that applies uh, back to what he said as well? Uh, yeah, I wasn't going to jump in, but when Ravi said that- No, please said, do. <laughs> he doesn't like the word AI. I actually completely agree with him. Uh, one of the jokes I say to my team is, you know, if the if the company doesn't know the difference between uh, convolutional neural network, regular neural network, NLP or NLU, right? It, it's, it's a bad sign. Um, and I, you know, it's not, uh, uh, most people don't know the difference, right? But I think um, the reason why, uh, differentiating them is important is that if you're good at vision, it doesn't mean that you know how to do um, NLP at all, right? It's, it's a totally different set of um, metrics that you're playing with. Um, it's a totally different set of algorithms, actually. And so, uh, you know, um, I, I would, uh, when you're hiring, this is actually good, uh, good advice for, uh, for portfolio companies or for any entrepreneurs, um, do not just hire someone that says AI experience, right? So uh, you actually have to hire the exact you know, uh, background experience that you're looking for, which necessitates that you understand a little bit about, you know, coding yourself to actually know to hire the right, the right people. What Ravi is doing with, uh, with data is probably more akin to, you know, genomics. It is not, you know, I, I think hiring someone that, that worked on um, detecting if a, if a picture is a picture of a cat or something is not going to be helpful. So I think knowing those differences is super helpful, not just from an investor's perspective, but also, for founders that are hiring. Yeah, couldn't uh, couldn't agree more. Tess, anything to add on that? Yeah, uh, well, for myself, I believe in um, um, looking at the simple uh, startups that actually are helping us in our daily life um, that utilizes, um, I would say, uh, patterns to help curate simply, for example, you know, I really do, um, I think music, um, when just simply learning the patterns of being able to apply technology so that when Pandora, you know, evolved, that was just something that was like interesting. So over time, your music gets smarter with pattern recognition um, and then later evolving into Spotify. And now we have, you know, everything else um, in terms of um, AI assistance, you know, they call it that, you know, what is behind the hood, under the hood, you know, we don't know, but what is reality is, you know, you can, and there have been so many friends that have replaced, you know, a, a potential executive assistant with using um, a, you know, online, um, you know, a uh, AI assistant um, to help them manage their schedules and do bookings. Um, and it is only the technology and the company only is as good as it could be based on how much data and information they can get. So therefore that's about users and over time, um, the data set. So that's you know just been super interesting because those things have changed my lives daily in terms of cost reduction or being able to simplify my life or bring small delights to life, and I think that's what you're going to see, especially um, you know at the very earliest form. Um, you know, there's that side uh, besides obviously you know applying all the technology AI, uh, you know all the different technologies in biotech and you know genomics, which um, I'm learning a lot with a lot of the uh, various uh, companies that you know I am seeing. So I think um, that's important. Another uh, portfolio company, uh, they're in privacy tech um, login. So they absolutely are you know looking at uh, their next stage. Um, you know now that they've gone past seed funding and they've done some great stuff in terms of product market fit. They are looking at how AI is going to apply to how um, you know privacy, users' privacy is going to be um, better utilized uh, from enterprise or from users using AI. But that's something that they're planning, you know, in the forward uh, future. So they're looking at that, and you gotta, you know, look at that technology component very early to be one of the pillars, so that you make sure, you know, you are making sure that you're able to bring the best tech to the market. Yeah, and, and, and I agree. And I think uh, one thing I want to bring to the group 
and no one has mentioned it. So I'll, I'll kind of poke the bear on this is, uh, uh, yesterday on, on our show yesterday, we spoke about, um, the amount of data that's been created over the past couple months, right. In various different industries and around various products. Um, in some cases it was referred to as 10 weeks of data that uh, is equivalent to 10 years. Uh, it's almost a decade's worth of data in such a concentrated time. While great, it also has a level of bias and there's a big trust factor or maybe not a uh, trust factor in that process. Would love to hear from, from, from the group on what your thoughts are when it comes to things like artificial intelligence and, and again, to Ravi's point, machine learning and data, specifically around trust and bias because data can have a bias, right? There's not necessarily that emotional or human element as the categories that uh, Gwen had pulled, uh, pulled out. And then also when it comes to trust, so to Ivan and some of the categories he pulled out in industries, um, how can you know and how can you trust to say the data that you're getting and know that it's real uh, as well? So uh, Ivan, I would love to start with you and guys feel free to chime in. I'll, I'll be mindful and let you kind of free flow, but uh, Ivan, you know, what's going on and where do you feel we're at when it comes to trust and that bias of data uh, when it comes to AI and, and uh, machine learning? Let me separate that um, in two camps, one being the consumer side and one being the enterprise side. For example, with the consumer side, one of the companies we work with right now is the leading face recognition companies in the world, it's an American one. And even at 98, 99%, is that accurate enough or not? So what they're doing is they're supplementing the face data with the voice data to bring it down to 99.99% accuracy to identify an individual in order to, be, to uh, maybe conduct a transaction. And then in order to go one step further, the individual's cell phone ID has to match the person's face as well as the person's voice. So there are three points of identification that all have to match so that you know this is exactly the individual that you think it is. So is that here today? No, can it be done over the next few years? Absolutely. But the, uh, people are starting to go in that direction. The, the problem with that is, do you as an individual want your identity to be known like that? So do, is it an opt-in or is it forced upon people? How do you do it? So that's one. On the enterprise side, it is significantly easier because you're dealing essentially with output and with transportation. And so that's a much, much easier thing to do. I think on that side, the issue can become fraud, uh, theft, but those are easier issues to deal with versus individual privacy. So I think the enterprise side will be solved a little bit more easily and faster than the consumer side. I'll, I'll jump in there on, on that one and seeing some, some things about on the enterprise side, because we have to keep in mind that um, there, there is fraud and theft, but we also have to think about public safety. Um, the, uh, if you think about autonomous vehicles or smart grids, um, if there are bad actors, uh, you know, state, state actors or private um, that, that want to wreak havoc for political or economic reasons. You know, as more and more things get automated um, and, and machines talking to machines in, in those sorts of environments, there's, there's, you know, tremendous downside for society. If, you know, smart grids get penetrated or, or autonomous vehicles get penetrated. So I, I think that the, th there is the, the bias that you mentioned from a particular period of time that may be different than other periods of time, but the security and trust of integrity of the data being used for AI um, or, or you know, machine to machine uh, interactions, decision-making in some way is a, is a real Achilles heel. The, the, you know, if, if, if the data cannot be determined to be uh, of, of utmost integrity, um, we might not allow these machines to make these decisions um, be, because things can really go haywire fast. Um, so that's a, that's a big area of concern, I think, to the adoption is, is the, the, the security and integrity of the data that's driving the, uh, the actions. Uh, 
I'll just add a couple of data points. Um, so this is uh, this is a piece of data that's from a couple years ago. It's something like 98% um, of all the pictures and data that we have comes from you know the last two years, and I think that number has only gotten more extreme, um, especially the last few months. So I think it's about 99% now for the last year. Um, so we get increasingly more data, um, you know, every year that we have cheaper and cheaper hardware and technology and storage. Um, I, I do think that, you know, I, I do share, I, I don't think AI is going to turn into, you know, a robot and kill us all. I'm not that extreme, but I do share some concerns on sort of AI uh, unattended. Um, I do think AI is sort of like a child, like a three-year-old, right? And so if you don't teach it well, it's going to do, I mean, it's going to destroy your house, right? So um, there was, uh, Google had this um, AI platform where uh, it, it used the AI platform to filter out resume, right? And um, it ended up uh, deciding that uh, a male name candidate meant that it was gonna be a better programmer uh, just because there were more male engineers than female engineers at Google, right? And so um, it's, it's more like um, AI doesn't know the difference between correlation and causation, and it does not have the capacity to dive into what causes what and what's contributing to, to what. And so that's the that's the training part that we need to do as scientists. Um, um, there was another uh, data that uh, was given to me by Dropbox. Um, the CEO said, you know, uh, um, structured label data is valuable. Unstructured, unlabeled data is a cost, as in you have to store it in memory. Um, so, uh, you know, that's so labeling and structuring data is essentially babysitting it and training it, right? It, that's the first step. So those were those are the points I would make. Ravi, would love to hear your points as well. I mean, you're in the financial markets. How does this apply uh, in your world as well? Yeah, I guess um, probably something I'm going to be saying a lot and probably have, it, uh, have a slightly different tack on things, but that's mostly because I would say that my business is is very much a consumer of large amounts of data, but we don't end up putting a huge amount of data out into the world. So it's not that I would really talk about my business as, as producing data that you as a consumer or, or other, some other sort of institution has to trust. Having said that, uh, we, we have a lot of trust issues about the, the, the data that comes into us. I mean, I mean, and we're blessed with huge amounts of data, but as we all know, uh, quantity is uh, not always better than, than quality. So it, with the data that we work on, we have to do a huge amount of cleansing to make sure that certain things are adjusted and backfilled and corrected into a format that we can use and actually make sure that uh, we're avoiding the garbage in, garbage out type of paradox in terms of how we're trading, uh, training our neural networks to be able to navigate in in the future when they're working with data that they haven't seen before. So, so that 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 I would say is the is the main main issue for us. But I guess from a from a more general standpoint, uh, I agree with with everything that everyone said so far. I mean, it's a it's a it's a balancing point. Uh, like Gwen said, you know, any any AI bot that you put out into the wild is at the mercy of, of what you fed it in its training process. And let's take, let's take fake news, for example. If you have a bot that's working as a, as a news scraper to do whatever its end goal happens to be, if there's a lot of garbage out there that it's scraping off Facebook or, or Twitter or whatever else it happens to be, then it's not going to do what you expect it to do. And it's, it's likely not going to fulfill the goals that you want it to fulfill. So this is the this is the hazard that we face it's a huge challenge i i really don't think that the, the big data providers out there are really doing enough they know themselves they're not the governments don't really have a, have much power or pull over them to 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 correct this so it's it's an interesting discussion of how the world will will tackle this problem going forward and 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 tess as same for you i mean again what are you seeing in this in this space, this intersection? Yeah. And Dan, I saw you unmuted. So as soon as Tess is done, I'll, I'll jump back over to you. So uh, feel free. Great, to yeah, Kyle. So definitely, um, I've been staying close and just learning from experts. So um, I was born and raised in Toronto. Obviously, uh, University of Waterloo has extremely strong AI, um, you know, talents. 
And, um, you know, I'm um, the chief ambassador of the University of Hawaii of Engineer, largely because she, um, the, uh, you know, dean there, she was um, herself technical background and absolutely supportive entrepreneurs. So when Professor um, Alex Wong, he's one of the notable professors there, came up with his uh, startup very early um, in that early pre-seed stage um, because of the relationship that I really tried to build and add value, um, definitely was able to, you know, um, have a part, uh, have a, have the ability to be able to intro that to other great investors that was exactly able to understand what they were doing and also learn in that process. So with that said, obviously being able to, you know, uh, as an investor who truly at such early stages about hunting into the investments early and then, you know, being able to add value to introducing other strategic investors that help them. So um, as we all know, uh, Toronto has also University of Toronto that Jeff Hinson was from, and that's where Google, Google had, you know, acquired the whole team and yeah, even more. Um, and then with University of Waterloo, um, you know, uh, the, our notable um, Professor uh, Yosai Benye, he was able to, you know, really rise to a global stage with his uh, information, knowledge, education on AI. So I've been, you know, learning a lot from what all these uh, various, um, um, you know, um, uh, groups has been, you know, sharing about AI. Um, you know, Professor um, Alex Wang, he himself, uh, Darwin, his AI uh, emerged from stealth. Um, and they focus on uh, basically bringing AI um, building they, they are AI building AI platforms to the market. Highly interesting. He has several other AI uh, companies. Um, he's got his expertise, you know, under his belt. So been learning a lot of what the frontier tech is. There may not be, you know, currently the product market fit yet, but they focus on, you know, obviously enterprise. So those are just some things that, you know, happy to compare, compare notes with others and just, you know, learn together. Dan, I thank you, Tess. Dan, I saw you had a comment for what, uh, what Ravi was saying, so um, let you let you go. Yeah, so um, there's a, an interesting book out there uh, uh, by Rashad Tabakawala called um, Restoring the Soul of Business. And Rashad is the, just recently retired as the uh, uh, chief growth officer and, and, and chief innovation officer of Publicis, you know, the second largest media holding company in the world. And he'd grown up uh, in, um, you know, through the, the ad and marketing business from days of analog through digital and ran some of the largest digital components of Publicis and, and sat on the board of Publicis. And he recounts the, 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 the entire concept of, of the book is that you have to marry data with human intuition. And you know, the example of, of, of resumes looking for programmers, you know, because historically the best programmers or the majority of programmers had been male, that's the back data that the algorithms get trained on and that's what they go forward with. Um, whereas humans could look at that and be like, yeah, that doesn't make sense. And so, and, and he's got lots and lots of examples of decisions, you know, made by major corporations on both sides where they trusted the data too much where they didn't trust it enough and then where the marriage in between was. And, and um, uh, you know, he's, he, he's basically cautioning corporate America to not swing too far um, be, that, uh, to, to a, the data-driven decision-making uh, because it can lead to some, some disastrous results. Uh, that, and, um, you know, it, Describes it more instead of instead of looking to build bots, androids, whatever. Look to build bionic humans, humans that have the the power of of the digital technology infused into them, uh, but but don't lose the the uh, the insight, common sense, creativity of, of humans. So it's a it's a very interesting um, book. Again, based on decades of experience watching corporations make make these decisions. Yeah, and it's gonna be exciting to see kind of where they make decisions going forward uh, as well. And um, with that being said, to each of you, you are all investors, or we're all investors in this industry. Um, we've talked about a number of different layers and, and kind of what, uh, when it was a buzzword, when it wasn't, how it's being applied, how it wasn't being applied. But as investors, how are you looking at these spaces? How are you looking at companies? Um, in these areas or when they say artificial intelligence, when they say they're, they're powering or leveraging data in some way, um, 
how are you as investors kind of looking under, under the hood uh, as well? And uh, Dan, let's continue with you and we'll go around. Yeah, so we, we spend a lot of time thinking about, uh, do they have proprietary data? Because if they, if they just have access to the same data that everyone else, it's very hard to, to make sustainable differentiation in, in, the, in the, the business you're trying to, to develop. It's not impossible. Some do it. I mean, as a good example, you know, uh, in, in the hedge fund world, Renaissance Technologies, they've got access to the same data as everybody else, but they've, they've cranked out 66% per year returns for 30 years. I mean, there's just, you know, they but they do it with an incredible investment of, of uh, math and science. It's been called the, the best math and physics department in the world from all the PhDs that they hire into, uh, into there. Uh, and that's basically live, everyone lives on a college campus in effect on Long Island and, and just, uh, you know, crumbs true. But other than that, other than those edge cases, you, you need something like um, uh, where you're going to have data that no one else has uh, in some way. That one of our portfolio companies is called Understory, uh, where we have proprietary hardware that collects weather data at the ground truth, uh, small low cost hardware that gets deployed out and we collect um, the weather data at the ground truth you know, basis that we then can build our algorithms off of um, to predict weather going forward. And it's actually used for property and casualty insurance for, for uh, predicting weather and then, and then monitoring when, when weather events did happen. Um, but that's an example of uh, they've got data that no one else has. And so the bar, get, you don't, you know, it's much, much easier than to create algorithms that create differentiated outcomes than everybody else. Um, well, that, that's not always possible, but those are the things we look for. We, we, we think that there's going to be a lot of, um, uh, you know, regression to the mean if everyone is working off the same data sets. So we, we, we watch out for those things. Ivan, I see you shaking your head. Uh, any, anything to add as, as you are looking at several investments? And Gwen, I'm, I'm coming to you. You got 50% of your portfolio, so we're coming to you, uh, Ivan. I, I I agree with Dan completely, and he I you know is a lot more eloquent than I am. Uh, the way I look at it, though, is uh, the, I always begin by asking the question: What is the problem you're solving? Because to me, you know, data and AI for the sake of it is not enough. There's got to be a problem that they're solving so that we can apply this to it, and that problem has to be real and it has to be large and growing, and it, we, there's got to be a value to solving that problem. So my, I always start with that. And then uh, one of the other things that I think is going to happen is if you go back, I don't know, 20 years ago, you had internet companies, but nobody has internet companies anymore. It's embedded in everything that you do. And I think the use of uh, data and uh, everything else that we discussed today is going to be a part and parcel of everything that we do from now on. It's not going to be, oh, we are using AI to do this. It's just the way you will be doing this in the coming future. It's going to be like internet. So there's no difference. So that's the way I view it. It's a, it's a great point. It's just, just part of your stack. It's just a part of what to be expected, right? You're, you're building an application. You should be doing something with the data. I think you're, you're right. spot on. And Gwen, I'm coming to you to break everything we just said, but also, you know, again, you, you're looking at themes, you're looking at categories. So why are you looking at these? How are you kind of managing that portfolio from an investment standpoint as you're looking at these? Um, well, we're super nice to our portfolio companies. Basically, once you're in the portfolio, we're doing everything we can, right? Whether it's, you know, like, I mean, I joke that um, uh, for a portfolio company, I'm a free coder, I'm a free CFO, I'm a free headhunter. Like, it's, it's better than free labor because I paid you for the privilege of giving you free labor. But anyway, uh, that aside, um, the way we pick our portfolio companies is definitely like everyone talked about, you know, you have to have a way to get proprietary data or very specialized data. Um, it's not necessary that you have the data set already, but it has to be a very convincing way of how you're going to get it. Um, and then other than, but, you know, I think that's uh, necessary, but not sufficient, uh, the data itself. Uh, after that, I would actually, I, I think a lot of people just look at the deck to see if there's a PhD, uh, that's a CTO. 
And I think that's insufficient because I'll actually end up, you know, talking to the CTO and I'll get into the weeds of, you know, what is your algorithm? How are you filtering through the data? How are you laboring the data? How are you labeling the data? Um, you know, what are you, how are you cleaning the data? What's the, what's the mystery? You know, are you at 60% accuracy? How are you going to get to 80? Right. And so um, these are the nitty gritty questions. Um, and then I'll actually just look at the code um, because there are a lot of companies that don't have any code. Um, uh, and, you know, I, I think it's really hard right now to, um, as everyone knows, to hire a, um, uh, any, anybody with AI uh, coding background. So if you don't have somebody on your team already, it's extremely difficult and extremely expensive. So looking at the code tells me that there's somebody that is in the background already being, uh, already building these things. Yes. And um, myself, uh, through one of my um, uh, entities, uh, they are a, it's very uh, interesting, very early, several years ago, they are AI genomic biotech company that are simply, you know, um, using blood tests that they can help detect and treat cancer. Uh, to date, they've obviously raised already over um, hundreds of millions of dollars, but it was very interesting because they are focusing on creating tools that empower people to prevent to prevent, diagnose, and treat their cancer. Um, they are obviously, you know, um, um, very biotech background, but very early, like what Gwen said, they did have um, someone on the team that was able to help them navigate the AI experience. And today, as we see in some of the other competitors have IPO'd or they're in a space that actually is very important. Um, and I think, you know, being able to um, continue um, helping greater companies, you know, in these space and different sectors show up, you know, is you know, continuously what as investors we're all looking at. Ravi, same question to you. Yeah, so um, again, I, I mean, I, what, I, what I would go back in and say is it's really, it's really a domain question for everybody in terms of their own expertise and their own industry knowledge in really leveraging what, what you're doing. I mean, I, I, I'm, not a, I'm not an investor in, in sort of, I'm not out there in the in the wild looking at how other people are using AI. I'm just working with a team of people to make sure our use of AI is 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 in the best interest of what we're trying to achieve. So, we what I would say is is that we we take we take in investing in our world in a slightly different direction. We don't think about we don't think about trades on an individual level. The reason the reason why we went into this deep and reinforcement learning space is because we have a lot of in-house expertise on more on the more sort of generic domain of optimization so that's why we felt like that we could use that technology most effectively to take a portfolio of securities or an index of securities or whatever type of basket of securities and actually be able to train our algorithms on the on various historical properties of that data of that data uh, and, and actually have our AI be able to optimize a, a composition of those securities and be able to, and then and then use our in-house expertise. Um, again, I think other people have touched upon this as well, with the real expertise not being the programming or the IT infrastructure, but really sort of that, that human instinct on why tuning certain parameters or changing certain things or, or, or structuring the data in certain ways will actually improve the way the the neural networks are trained to do what they what they do because in the end the the offset to vast amounts of computational power and and, and multi uh, layered neural networks is that it, you know it's a much higher order of complexity and that also means that you're going into a much larger dom domain space which actually makes finding the needle in the haystack far more difficult. So having, having the scientists uh, that we have on board to actually home in on those sweet spots um, to train our algorithms and actually achieve results is the secret sauce, really. And it goes back to the, sort of the underlying point. It's not, about the, it's not about the technology. The research has been there for a long time. Now the missing piece is there with the computational power it's really just getting a collection of people who have a, an extremely strong background of, of scientific analysis and research and being able to, to put all the pieces together 
Um, and again, that's the ironic thing, right? We're talking about yeah. AI, but really it's the it's the human brain that puts it all together and makes it work. That it Ultimately. does. And, and, and with that being said, one of the big uh, kind of overarching questions I want to ask as, uh, as we come to wrap here is, what are you most excited about? What are you seeing on the forefront um, that has you most excited on the capabilities of artificial intelligence, machine learning, but really to Ivan's point, just the future of, of powering uh, applications and services by leveraging the data. What are you most excited about? And we'll start with Ravi. Gwen, I'm gonna finish with you. There's a good reason for it. So Ravi, let's start with you and then Dan, we'll come over to you. Well, I mean, I, I... It's hard to it's hard to put anything specific on that particular question, really. I mean, I, I guess I would say, it from an from a from an artificial intelligence perspective, or AKA just making the world very data driven within the constraints that I think one of the other speakers mentioned earlier in terms of the the pitfalls of using poor data. I, I'm just generally excited about excited about you know what what incredible things we're going to see in in five years, ten years, fifteen years. You know, we've talked about self-driving cars for a long time. You know, when is that going to happen? What's it going to look like? What are going to be the results? Uh, it's 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 really that sort of thing. I mean, um, you know, I'm looking forward to the day where I can sit in my car and read a newspaper instead of screaming at the guy, you know, cutting me off from the right or whatever. So that, those are the things that I'm looking forward to. Yeah, I'll... Um, uh... I think what um, we do a, a fair amount of investing in health tech and, and seeing the, uh, the applications in, in the health tech world um, are, are, are some that, that, that are probably most exciting to us. And uh, uh, there's some of the obvious, more obvious ones about, you know, better cancer care and things like that. But I'll, I'll highlight one. It's not a portfolio company of mine, but it's, there's a um, um, familiar with the team they, uh, they, they are what's called a supplemental benefits provider um, for the Medicaid population. So I don't know how much of you, the audience is in the, based in the U.S., but in the U.S., um, you know, Medicaid population, Medicare is for elderly, Medicaid is for low income. And particularly with the pandemic, uh, low income uh, population has been hit tremendously hard and uh, and inability to get services. And as a supplemental benefits provider, they're focused on providing things that not always direct medical care, but other things. And they're doing it all via a text-based interface with a, with, with a uh, AI application at the cloud to, uh, to, to pick up these text messages that low-income people are sending from their homes uh, and, and um, and, and then determining what best to deliver everything from uh, what they call the social determinants of health that are like sending in, you know, if their air conditioning is broke. It can have a huge impact on healthcare cost. Uh, if, if they've got pest problems in their home, um, uh, other sorts of things you don't necessarily think of as direct healthcare, but they actually have tremendous impact on healthcare costs. Um, uh, and, and so this company is using uh, uh, artificial intelligence to, to decipher and provide agents for just purely via text message. You don't have to download anything. Um, and and you, you see things like that that are uh, saving a tremendous amount of money for the state government, state governments or who run Medicaid, uh, money that they definitely need and providing better services to populations that, that uh, don't have not had access to them and, are, and it's getting far, far worse in, in this pandemic. So, you know, you see things like that, that are, uh, um, the, you know, that, that are doing well by doing good. Um, and uh, the business is growing insanely fast. It's adding, it's only raised $3 million and they're adding a million of ARR every 16 days. Mm -hmm signing up these uh, uh, Medicaid uh, plans to do it. So, so those, those are, I've, those are some examples you like to see. Yeah. And Ivan, I see you shaking your head. So I'm going to come to you next. I just love what he just said. Uh, you know, uh, I think there, I have two parts to this as always. One part is the excitement about there's probably a couple of kids somewhere coming up with some things that in about five years, we're going to look back and say, Oh my God, 
how did that get here? Kind of like, you know, how Google came out of nowhere and dominated and changed an industry. And I think uh, there, there's a lot of that going on. The, the other part of it is uh, it could also be used for negative reasons. And I'm actually concerned about that. Um, th this kind of usage has uh, taken place all uh, throughout history. So I'm very excited as well as, uh, well, a little concerned. Yes. Absolutely. Um, dear to heart, um, seeing too many friends experience various mental illness issues, um, especially, you know, it's so prevalent in, 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 you know, even in the media because of uh, COVID-19, that anxiety level mental illness is at the forefront. Um, the last 20 years been helping friends out that has, um, unfortunately, um, you know, illnesses in this area. And I found it was so challenging as an entrepreneur and then later as an investor. Where is the solution for this? I had looked at you know various um, 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 technology background, non-technology background, and we're talking simply from um, a true, how do you get some kind of solution to the hands of individuals that are experiencing this? And I'm so excited to say, I see AI is one of the key um, potential um, solution that can help with mental illness and how and why emotion AI is possibilities and promises in the mental health care. Um, emotion AI to chatbots, uh, chatbots delivering personalized therapy. So just think, super excited. I, um, I'm helping incubate several teams from start um, Stanford. Um, mainly a lot of them are postdocs uh, who have that background, but they probably you know would love some more assistance in the business end. So being able to pair them with more business co-founders has allowed me to see that they're able to use um, AI technology to help detect, you know, how fast or what is, you know, when the person is typing uh, on their cell phone and asking for help um, or just discussing, they don't know it themselves. So that has been very exciting. Their voice is analyzed in terms of their stress level and in terms of their, you know, uh, visual emotions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with um, AI technology, you're able to over time really be able to, you know, have some really good findings. And that's utilizing simply what is at our fingertip, the mobile phone, but being able to come up with various applications targeted at you know those who are in need, um, I'm just super excited with what the next five years, ten years will look like in this area. Same here. After hearing this panel right now, same here. And I, Gwen, I mean, close us out. What are you most excited for? What are you looking at? Are we going to see five themes versus four? Where are you? Uh, where are you getting excited about this? Um, so I just did a tally. Um, if you include all the other all the verticals, our portfolio actually has more than way more than half that is uh, <laughs> that's an AI. Because I, I just think that you know it sort of um, it, it percolates into every sector. So uh, it's interesting that uh, two of the areas that other other panelists have already talked about. So we actually do have a portfolio company that um, can assess cognitive function. So this is uh, aiming for detection of Alzheimer's. Um, and it's a mobile assessment and we're getting 510k approval for it. So it's it's coming. Um, and then another of our portfolio company is on autonomous trucking and they're actually closing their next round uh, fully subscribed. And um, I, I think, um, you know, I think Tesla crashes get a lot of news coverage, but what doesn't get news coverage is, you know, the hundreds and thousands of miles that's safely driven, right? Because it's boring. Nobody wants to cover it. You're not going to get any clicks. And, you know, I think that's the part that's been missing in our information base is um, autonomous trucking has actually been extremely safe. Um, you know, we haven't had one of these huge crashes for a while, uh, knock on wood. And that's actually one of our companies. Um, another one of our companies is um, doing operating system for logistics. I know one panelist talked about, um, you know, so much of our food goes to waste. Uh, well, they, you know, these trucking companies should become our portfolio companies' uh, clients because we do that. Um, we do the operating system for logistics and supply chain. So solutions are there. I think it's just, you know, connecting the right people to each other um, to get the solution implemented. Um, so I talked about vision. We have another um, portfolio company that is, uh, so, you know, we've all seen in um, sci-fi where you have a, a, a person or a robot with a contact lens that is a mini screen. So that's one of our portfolio companies. Um, they did raise a very big round uh, for the next round. Um, and they do have a prototype that is a contact lens that has, that has a screen in it uh, or a projection in it. 
Um, so, you know, there's, there's a lot that's going on. Um, I'll also talk about um, on the healthcare side, which is something that I'm super excited about. Cause I think, you know, as a country that spends 18% of our GDP on um, healthcare, but we are no better than the countries that spend 3% of their GDP. And those countries have lower GDP than we do. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot to be desired there. Um, so um, I, I really think that we're sort of biting at the edges of healthcare. So, you know, I talked about, you know, um, x-ray and uh, chest x-rays and detecting lesion. If I can code it, it's definitely done. Right? It's that easy. Um, so one of our port portfolio companies is um, using uh, AI vision um, to do uh, cancer pathology, right? And so that's another area that's, you know, we're starting to, radiology is definitely an area that um, is slowly but very surely be, being eaten by, by, uh, by computers. Um, another, um, what, another one of our, our portfolio companies is a, um, a, you know, like when you were a kid, your, your mom's or your dad is usually the one telling you to, you know, take your medicine and whatnot. Well, we've replaced that with a robot, a very friendly robot. Right. And so instead of a parent nagging you, you now have a little kid robot that tags along and <laughs> makes sure that you're, you're pharma compliant. Um, we have another company that is, you know, so another way to invest in, in AI is to invest in the picks and shovels rather than you know, the, the uh, taking a bet. And so one of our portfolio companies actually enhances medical imaging. Um, so if you, um, you know, how I lamented for every particular sliver of uh, radio, radio, radio um, uh, sorry, ra radiology that AI is trying to take over, we need at least 10,000 images of that one particular sliver. Um, if we can twist it by five degrees, right, that actually doubles the number of, um, of, uh, of, of, uh, of data points that we have. So uh, this portfolio company cleans up the images, also twists it and flips it to double and triple the number of uh, data points that we have. Wow. Um, lastly, I know I said, um, so <laughs> yeah. other, last, the, last one, we got to, we're, we're running just a few minutes over. So last one, go for it. Okay. So genomics. Um, so we are on the third generation long read genomics. Um, we also have single molecular nucleic acid sequencing. So um, the, the old process, the reagents alone used to cost $7,000. Now our portfolio company can do this in a hundred dollars. That's it. <laughs> wow. Okay. I'm, I'm, I, uh, I am not a robot, so I'm still processing all that, but that was a, a lot of great data points from all of you guys. Thank you so much. Um, if anything, I can make jokes on cue. So maybe I've got that going for me, but with that being said, huge thanks to all of you today. I think there's another two and a half hours of show we could do uh, with this group and we'll come back to everybody uh, and maybe do a second follow-up episode uh, of this with everyone because there's just so much more we can go in depth. But thank you to each and every one of you for sharing all of your insights. And hopefully your audience have a little bit more knowledge as to where this industry is going, what's currently happening, and then also how to prepare yourself either as an investor or as a founder um, on how to be successful and thrive uh, in these industries and new era of technology. And with that being said, closing thoughts and where everyone can find you. Ravi, let's start with you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Carl. You know, I found it, I found it very useful myself to hear, uh, to hear what the other, other panelists have to say. As, a, as I say, uh, I'm not, I'm not an active investor in terms of going out and meeting other, other AI driven companies or data driven companies. We're really, we're really sort of got our heads down in terms of the, the development that we're trying to do on our own on our own trading strategy. So it's it was, it's been really interesting to me. But yeah, I mean, at the end of the end of the day, if I was going to leave anything uh, with people, I, I, I you know I would I would love people to to know that there are very interesting things going on in the investment management industry now. The investment management industry, the financial industry as a whole, unfortunately, is. As much as they would like to advertise that it's very progressive and, and, and modern, it really is something that hasn't changed for over 100 years. Um, and the level of innovation in my eyes is, has been quite minimal. So I think but now we're getting, we're getting to a more interesting time where people are trying to, starting to embrace technology as a whole. Uh, and uh, from our perspective, it's particularly interesting using this, uh, this machine learning and, and AI stuff. So. Give us a call if you want to if you want to invest your money in a in a new interesting way. And what's the website they can go to to find you? We're at magic-carpet.ch. Awesome, Dan. Same to you. Closing thoughts and where can everyone find you? I just appreciate the uh, the, the time and all the insights from everybody. It's great to uh, um, uh, connect with everybody here and, and love to hear from. Uh, 
uh, you know, the audience uh, as well as uh, other panelists over time. Um, so we're 4490ventures.com. Um, and uh, you can you can find us there on you know LinkedIn, Twitter as well. And and uh, um, so look forward to uh, furthering the discussion. Thanks. Awesome, Tess. Excellent. Uh, so um, super excited. Um, as I mentioned, um, being able to grow up in Toronto, um, I mentioned University of Waterloo, University of Montreal uh, over, you know, close by University of Toronto. I'm very excited. Any investor or just, you know, entrepreneurs and founders who also want to be part of the ecosystem, the Creative Destruction Lab. Um, born out of the University of Toronto, um, Professor Ajay, he started this. Uh, they basically focus on pursuing commercial opportunities um, predicated on the applications of machine learning and artificial intelligence. They're, you know, funding um, early seed round. So, you know, if any founders or entrepreneurs is interested, um, if they really think they have a great application. So they basically um, have seven streams focusing on um, artificial intelligence, blockchain, health, matter, Quantum and space, um, and a few other mm -hmm. tracks that they are always, um, you know, starting with. So I think um, if anyone wants, um, you know, intros or you know, assistance uh, to great teams that are being born out of that ecosystem, many Silicon Valley investors have already, you know, um, I've already helped bridge that. So happy to do that. And if there's anything else I could be helpful with, so you can find me Tess um, in on LinkedIn, uh, Tess How, and also Twitter Tess How One. Uh, looking forward to keeping in touch with everyone. Awesome, Tess. I got a quantum book I'm going to send you after the show. Uh, now that you just mentioned that, Ivan, closing thoughts. Where can everyone find you? For your time. Uh, this was a good learning experience for me as well. Our website is navigatevc.com, and uh, my email is Ivan at navigatevc.com. Uh, we welcome um, all correspondence. We'd love to hear from you. Awesome, Gwen. Closing thoughts. Where can everyone find you? Sure, uh, Gwen Cheney, C H E N I, on LinkedIn and on Twitter. Um, you can go to our fund, fusionfund.com. You can actually just send us a, a blank email. You don't need a warm intro, especially if you're an AI founder. We'd love to hear from you. Um, we have a lot of AI companies in the portfolio. And as we've stated earlier, we're free labor that we pay for you. We pay you to take our free labor. <laughs> <laughs> and there, and where, and where can everyone find you again? What's the website? Uh, fusionfund.com. Perfect. There you heard it. Heard it. You've got all of the access to all of these investors and free services and work from Gwen and her team as well. But without uh, any further delay, guys, thank you so very much. Really appreciate all the insights again. Thank you to our live audience for all your questions, for all your comments, for tuning in today to another edition of VCTV. I'm your host, Kyle Ellicott. Big thank you again to Elena and to the LA Token teams. We'll be back here tomorrow for another edition of VCTV. Everyone have